Hello again and welcome back. Now let's talk about real-time distributed scheduler. What is this? Up to now, we were handling a scheduler for a single computing node, for a single processor. So this processor had a set of tasks which shall be executed and it has to find a way to fulfill the time and requirements to execute all these tasks according maybe to priorities or to deadlines. But up to now, we have a fixed set of tasks for this processor. Now we want to handle a different situation. We have many nodes and we have many applications and these applications may be executed on different nodes. If we have the case, each application has only one place where it can be executed, for example, it has some requirements to input output or something like this, then we have this problem for distributed scheduler no, node. We have this task of distributed scheduling only if the task can be executed on different nodes. And this is a really, really difficult task. If we don't need to have it, then it's better we don't do that, but because it's really difficult. Okay, let's see what is the situation. Uh, we have a set of processes and communications messages which shall be executed. This means these processes has to be assigned to processors and the communications the messages shall be assigned to network or communication links. And important, we have a real-time system. So when we have an, when we search or find an allocation, we shall try to have an allocation which all constraints, timing constraints are fulfilled. Only then we can say this system is scudable. Okay, we can have a schedule if all these constraints are Feasible are fulfilled, else we have a problem. Then we cannot execute this, this set of tasks and communication in this uh, uh, computer network we have. Okay, uh, maybe you remember this. I hope you remember. This is the task of a typical scheduler, a dynamic scheduler, for example. We have a list of tasks which shall be executed. Then we have the scheduler. The scheduler scans this last of task and take the decision which of these shall be executed next. And then we switch, uh, we send this information to the task switch. The task switch will remove the current running task from the CPU, store if context, take the new task, set its context to the CPU and start the execution. And then the task will get the CPU time. Okay, this is the normal process which we have for dynamic uh, scheduler. If we have a static scheduler, then it's predefined when shall be executed which task. In this case, the task, the effort is done by the programmer and not by the system, not by the execution uh, software. But now let's talk about dynamic scheduling. And another important thing here is, if you can see, this scheduler takes very short decisions. The only thing it, the only decision which it takes is who shall be the next, and that's all. And what will be the problem or what your problems will come later, it doesn't care. It takes only the decision what shall be next, one moment after one moment. We can try to make it better if we consider all applications which shall come in the future and try to make a better uh, uh, a, a schedule when to execute what according to communication when shall be done which communication who is waiting for what but that's really a difficult task and this is what we are going to see now how to how to find a solution for uh, such problems first let's make a classification of schedulers okay we can classify scheduler on the two different aspects first when the decisions are taken it can be a static scheduler if the decisions are taken by the programmer. The programmer makes a schedule, makes a program where to execute what and when to execute this. So all decisions are a priori. And then the programmer creates a table containing all activities and times when shall be where e e executed. And maybe not only which processes, but maybe to which messages shall be transmitted when or the, the, the dynamic scheduler, the decisions are taken when on the fly, 
when the scheduling is running. So at every any time point, we see the list of tasks which shall be executed. We take a look to the resources and the scheduler takes the decision what to execute where and when. Okay, this is the difference. This is on the fly and this is a priori by the programmer. And the next way how to classify, uh, classify the, the, the scheduler is it's preemption or not preemption. If tasks may be interrupted. If task may be interrupted at any time, then we are talking about a preemptive system. We have preemption. Any process may be interrupted, suspended, it has to sleep, and another process can continue working at his place. And again, and this decision will be taken by the operating system. And a not preemptive system, not preemption is, it process has to say when it has concluded and another process might be be executed. So uh, it gives the control voluntary. If it doesn't want, if a process wants to keep the control for always, then it will keep the control for always and so all other processes has to wait. Okay, these are the two topics which we are going to handle in the next, uh, in the next uh, slices. First, we are going to concentrate on dynamic schedule because in this case, the programmer just try to find an possible schedule, and this is more interesting for us, it, the, the, the schedule itself has to take the decisions. And then we deal with preemptive and non-preemptive systems, what is the difference? Okay, maybe you remember <laughs> we were talking about the problems we have with distributed systems. Uh, with distributed systems, we have an asynchronous system because all uh, nodes or computer have its own time and the communication between computer and computer or not and not has a delay which may be different than uh, each time. So we have a no common shared memory and no global clock. The, the uh, state of the system is distributed in all memories of all nodes. It is unpredictable, the process delays. We don't know how long exactly the process will take and exactly the time the same with communication. The delays are not deterministic, so we cannot know for sure how long the communication will take place. Then we have the problem with the global time and global state are really difficult to realize. We can have only an approximation of the global view of the global state of the system. The only way to have a consistent global view is to stop all activities, take a snapshot and see what is the state of every node, of every application, of every communication way. But for that, we have to stop the system. In normal operation, it's not feasible to stop a control system. So we cannot have a global view of the world system. We have only an approximation. We can simulate synchronous distribution and have a best estimation what is the state of the system. Exactly the same with clocks. We don't have a global clock. We don't know exactly what time is it, which not, because <coughs> we have to add these communication delays. So we have only an estimation, maybe the, the, the average of all clocks, and this will be the time in the system. Okay, these are the problems which we have uh, with distributed systems. Now let's see about allocation and scheduling. We have some resources and some tasks, and we have to find an allocation of these resources to this task. And the relationship is M to N. We have M resources and N tasks, and we have to distribute them. Okay, uh, the distributed scheduler needs to collect all resources information of all nodes is instead of only one node. So the scheduler has to know what is the state of every node, the load, the load, the, the, the idle time and so on, and which task shall be executed. And then it can make an overall decision after collecting all, all these resources uh, of information. These are the three ways we can have to take this decision. The best one is think global, see what is the global environment of the system and act local. So each node can take its own decisions when to execute what, but it knows the global state of the system. Uh, do you remember in the last slides I say I said to know exactly the global state of the system is really difficult. We can have only an approximation and this is what we are going to have.
Okay, this is the best case. The next is think global and act lo uh, global. Uh, sorry, think local and act local. So you don't look to the whole environment. You look only to the task which has to be done by this uh, process and take the decisions only looking at this process and acting local. So maybe you can find a very nice um, sequence when to execute which process, but you are not considering if other processes are waiting for your information for one of your local processes. So maybe this will be allocated for you later because you don't see the, the requirement, the other uh, node is waiting for data for, for this process. So this is the case if you think only local, you see only your local resources in your local node and act local. And the worst thing you can have is think local, see only your local resources and take global actions. If you don't see what the other are doing, so you see only the small thing you have and you, you take decisions which are going to affect the performance of all nodes. Okay, then what we are going to try is the best solution and this is think global, take a look to the global system and act local. Each scheduler, each scheduler in each node by itself. Uh, so, for example, each figure can take, in, in some game, each figure could take his decision what to do, but looking not only at his environment, but looking about the whole table. Okay. Now, what is the difference between this global and local management? Uh, we have global distributed tasks, and locally, we have a local scheduler. So, the task will be distributed globally. Uh, we have a scheduler who knows which task can be executed and which not. Maybe we have some restrictions that not all tasks may be executed on a, a, all nodes. Maybe some tasks require some input-output devices which are allocated only to this node and then this task has to be executed only in this node. Then we don't have any freedom to take the decision to execute this task somewhere else. Or maybe there are only two nodes or three nodes which are able to execute this and we have 10 other nodes which are not able to execute this task. And these are new constraints and, <clears throat> and are reducing the freedom, the degree of freedom for the distribution. Okay. Then, knowing all this, we can distribute the tasks, which task can be executed in which node. And then each node will take a look to the task it has to execute and take the local decisions according to the time request every task can say when it shall be executed, input-output request, which data is available, and communication request. But here we are missing something. We are missing what if other tasks in other nodes are waiting for information or for messages for one of these tasks. This shall be considered too, and this is more difficult. This could be, for example, the communication request. Okay, and now how to act locally. We have two ways. We have event trigger, so events can arrive, for example, a signal from a device or a message arrive and then we activate, we start a sequence of activities. The other thing is time trigger. We know when shall be executed everything and maybe in the world network. So if we have a somehow synchronized clock, which is difficult, a difficult case, but uh, we saw already how to synchronize clocks. So let's assume the clocks are somehow synchronized. And then we know when shall be each, uh, what executed where. And then we can take the decision when to execute locally a task to allow other tasks to be executed at the time later when it shall be executed. If they require, they need data from us, for example. So I am waiting for time points and then I'm going to execute locally what I have to execute locally. Okay, uh, let's take a, a look how to see the event triggered works. This is this an event occurs and then we start a sequence of activities. For example, this is the root event. Here trigger uh, we trigger the action, this uh, chain of actions, and this could be, for example, a signal or a message is coming. Okay, then one process will be executed and it sends a message to the network and on the other side of the network, another processor will get this data, another task will be activated. So we have this chain, we start this task, this task sends data to the network, the data will be, the data will be transmitted in the network, and another node gets data and activates another task. 
and then we have this chain of activities started from this root event. Okay, uh, about event trigger, we can say, <coughs> oh, sorry, a task triggers a transaction of action whenever an event occurs. This is the beginning, the trigger of this sequence of actions. There is only one deadline, and this is one it shall be completed, the whole chain. So we don't see when shall be a, a concluded the first process or the communication. We see only everything together, from here to here, and then we know the end time, when shall we conclude with this chain of operations. And from then on, all units in the transaction are activated, triggered by one to the next, to the next, to the next, is a chain. And we can say under certain assumptions, for example, we have a load load, uh, this is the most efficient way of scheduling transactions. Everything will be scheduled or activated as soon as possible. So actually it's a very effective way, but uh, we have a, only a very local view, but it works, it works pretty well. <coughs> okay, then we have the time trigger. With time trigger, we have some gaps. We know I start this at this time and I have an estimation how long it will take. If I have this estimation, then I add some uh, margin to be safe, and then I know when the next action shall be activated. For example, the network. The network shall begin transmitting a message. If I know this will take so long, and it starts at this point, plus the safety margin, then I know when shall I begin sending this message. And if I know this, and I know how long the upper bond of the transmission, then I know when this task can be activated, which is waiting for this message. So everything will be time triggered. This is not waiting uh, the message to arrive, so that we know the message will arrive at this point. And to be sure, after a marching uh, time, we know when shall we be, uh, when we shall activate this other task, this other thread. And so you see here, we are losing some time. Okay. And this is the time trigger. What when, how can we say about this uh, time trigger method? Uh, first, we need a global time base. <coughs> All nodes have to be synchronized because the clock here is not the same like the clock here and not the same like the clock here, but they, they have to be synchronized to be able to execute this properly. So we have to have prior to this, this time synchronization, which we saw already in other lectures. Okay, and then the transactions and actions are initialized by the predefined time points, not a chain. This will activate this and this, this and this, this, but every activity has a time point where it shall be activated. Maybe it will be pre-compiled. And then we have to consider a jitter because the clocks will differ, the delays will differ, so we cannot be sure when everything will be concluded. Then we have to consider this jitter and add the safety merging to a each time computation. And under certain conditions, it's possible to find an offset from application to application to eliminate the schedule flutter. For example, an offset from here to here, so we can be sure at the end, we don't have a jitter, but all, it will be always deterministic at, a, at a, some time point. Okay, and now the best thing is the best effort. Every activity will be activated as soon as possible. We don't need an extra plan, which will say at this time I should execute this, but every activity for example, this activity or sending of message or processing these measures, everything will be activated as soon as possible. This is something like the event trigger. We have a chain of applications. And this is most of the time how most applications are implemented. The best effort, just everything execute as soon as possible. Do not wait and do not uh, change the sequence of applications. Okay, uh, then we have the data stream approach. We were talking about events at times, and we can have something similar with data. Every application <laughs> needs some data to be executed. For example, some input services, then when these input services are there, then it can perform some activity and forward output services, forward data. 
Okay, uh, for this data stream approach, we have unicast, and this is a relationship from one producer and one consumer. That is an unicast transmission. He will produce the data, he will consume, and so we have a chain one to one. Or we have a multicast. This is like something like a tree structure. One producer and many consumers. And exactly the same, like here, each producer can have many other consumers, so the number of activations is growing. Here we keep a thread, one, then the next, then the next. Here, one, then we have maybe three. From each of these, maybe we have four, then we have 12, which are ready to be executed, and each of them have maybe two, then we have 24, which are ready to be executed. And so the number of activities which can be executed can be growing exponentially. This is the multicast uh, approach, one to n. Okay, With, what can we say about this data approach? Um, <coughs> <coughs> we have two types how to organize this data stream. The first one is network centric and the second one is not centric. And it depends where the actions are beginning, uh, are planning at the beginning. In a network-centric approach, we begin with the planning or the specification of messages. We say which messages shall be transmitted and what is the content of the messages. And if we know when shall be transmitted each message, for example, if I have to trigger one device to, to perform some, some function, then I can say, okay, this message shall arrive at this time point and shall contain this data. And in order on this message to be here, I have to make a priori this other processing. Okay, then I begin with the specification of measures, and from then I will the schedule of the messages, when shall be transmitted, and propagate to the task which shall be executed in order to generate these messages. And this is the net centric approach. I begin thinking in messages, I begin thinking in the network. The other thing is not centric. I begin thinking in applications. I begin thinking in the appli uh, uh, applications which are going to be executed in the nodes. So at the beginning, I make a specification of tasks. What shall be activated? And then if I know which tasks shall be activated, I can compute which inputs each task needs. And then I can create a schedule of tasks, when shall be activated this task, and then I will know which data needs every task, and then I propagate this back to the parameters to the messages. So I'm beginning with applications, and then the, the communication is what I need to execute these applications. Here I begin with communication, and the applications is what I need to generate this data which I'll, I, I can transmit. Okay, these are the two ways. And another thing very important when I dealing with the real time and communication and the uh, multi processing, then I shall have an estimation of how long it will take. So I can know if my schedule is feasible or not. I have two possible solutions. For example, I have a linear system, and the linear system is the case of this single unicast. I have one producer, one consumer, from this consumer only one producer, and so on. Then I have this situation, is only a chain. And then it's not so difficult. If I want to know what will be the delay and how much I need for this chain, I have just to add the worst case of this processing plus the worst case of this communication plus processing plus communication. And adding all these times, I will know how long I will need from here to here. If I have a multicast system, so a parallel system, one application can trigger many others, in this case only two or three, then I have to find the critical fat. So from all these fats which shall be activated, I can find the longest, not only the number of nodes, but I shall know how long each of these need, and then adding the times of the longest path, that is the critical path, then I can find the time bound, the maximal delay from the trigger from the application until it's concluded. Okay. Sorry, I was here. Let's take an example. Uh, we have two processors, 
we have this processor one and processor two, and we took already the decision, this task will be executed on this processor. How we took this decision, this will come later. But at the moment we know processor one has task P, one, two, three, and four. And processor two has the task P5 and P6. And then we have this communication. This process generates data for this other, and this generates data for this other, and this is other is running in our other processor. So we have to use the network. And then we know for every execution, the worst game, how, how long each task will need and how long the communication from task to task will need. We can assume the task from here to here will need some time because we are using the network. The communication from here to here is inside of the same computer. So we can assume this time will be so short and we can uh, ignore this. So all these times will be ignored. We have to consider only the delays when we are using the network. If we want to be very exact, then we can consider these times too, but they are normally much, much slower, smaller as this using the network and even smaller than the processing time of, of each node. Okay, this is an example. Which sequence shall we use? Okay. Of course, we have to begin with P1, but then we have two options. After P1, we can execute P2 or P4. And then we have again two options. If we execute P2, then we can execute P3 or P4. But let's now, for the moment, take a random solution. Any one, uh, maybe it will not be the best. So we take the solution first. I will execute P1, then P2, then P4. Then I send the measures from 4 to 5. So I'm taking thus. P1, P2, and then I execute P4, and I send this message. Then I come back here, I execute P3, and I send this message. P3, and I send this message. Huh? After this, I can execute the applications P5, and this applications P5 takes very long. It's a very long uh, time. So this message will arrive at this point, but we don't need it we need it later. So we will store this message and as soon as P5 is concluded, concluded, we have everything which we need. So we need this and we need this to execute P6. And if we add all this time, two time units for P2 plus one and so on, plus this time for communication, uh, please take care. These are parallel actions. In the same time as we are executing P3, the network is transporting this message from here to here. And in the same time as P3 is still being executed, P5 began already the executions. And in the meantime, we will have these transmissions. Hmm? So if we add all these times, we have a delay from here to here from 16 time units. And now let's try to find a better solution. Take a look and try to think which could be a better solution to make the time from here to here a little bit faster. What we did before was this here, then this, and this. I think it's not difficult to see. It's a better idea to execute P4 immediately because someone is waiting for us. But this is something you can see it if you take a global, a, a global view of, of, of this picture. But if you are looking only at this processor, of your scheduler doesn't know about who is waiting for what in other nodes, then you cannot know. You cannot know what is better to execute P2 or P4. But if you have a global view, you can look at everything, then you can see it will be better to execute now P4 because someone is waiting for that. Okay, and this will be the other solution. We execute P1, P4, we begin with the transmission, and in the same time, parallel to this, we execute P2, and P true, and this P5 can begin earlier. And this will come a little bit later, but it doesn't matter. It can be used later. So we have one time unit faster. Here we have 16, here we have 15 time units. But I said before, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, you can take this decision only if you have this global view. Only looking at the local view, you cannot know what is better. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> and the worst case will be execute first P1, P2, P3, and then send the message and then continue with P4. 
Then P6 has already this data, but it cannot begin because it has to wait until P5 concludes and P5 is waiting for that. So this will be the worst case. First does, and then this way. Okay, you can do it better or you can do it worse. And now let's try to do it by ourselves. We have these two nodes, not one and not two. We start here one action and then we have this chain of actions. And this is the time we need for the communication. Inside of the node is the time we need for the delay of the, of the node, four three, and so on. And this is the time we need for the communication. I assume for the communication inside of the same node is almost zero. So I said we can ignore this. So it's zero, zero. But the communication going through the network, it takes some time. In this case, two, a four, two, and four. And it's not always the same because it depends on the size of the message. Maybe this message is very big and this message is very short. And therefore this message takes twice as much as this other message. And now let's try to find some solutions. Okay, first, of course, we have to begin with P1 within the first process, and it will be executed from here to here. And as soon as it's concluded, and we can send this message, and this message will take four time units. So process, this process three will be executed only after this delay, this delay plus this delay. Process two, he got this data already, but cannot be executed now because it's waiting for this data. So we have to wait until three is concluded, then we transmit this data and we can begin with process number two. And immediately after concluding process two, we can begin with process four, and then we can send the data to process six, and then it will be started here. And now the question is, this the best schedule we can do, or can we do it better? First, the worst case, uh, we assume here each task will send data after its conclusion, but the reality will be different. Maybe this task could send this message while in the middle of, of its execution and at the end of its execution will send this, this message. Not all messages will be created at the same time in shape of the task and not all messages will be transmitted at the same time. A bad solution will be first to transmit this data. We don't need it. We have to wait. Oh, and then at the end to transmit this data, which someone is waiting and the communication is taking longer. Okay. Okay, the normal case is um, the messages are going to be sent as soon as possible. So we don't have to wait until the end of process three, like this. Here we send this message and here we start this application with the next. We can send the messages earlier. But it's then it's really difficult to make a model of the system because we know the execution time of this process three, but we don't know when in the middle of this process, we will send this message. A solution is to split uh, these processes in many sub-processes, and each sub-process will send a message un at the end of its execution. So instead of having one process which generate two messages, we have two processes. One will generate this message, and the other will generate this message, and it, each process will generate the message at, the, at its own end. So, and each process will generate exactly one message. Okay. And now, what is the schedule problem? <clears throat> we can have a best effort. Everything will be executed as soon as possible. But we have uh, different options. Uh, use a second. I'm missing some diagram here. Yeah, I think it comes later. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, and then we have an optimal uh, with that, if, if we want to find the optimal scheduling, this is most of the time a static schedule. So the programmer made many analyses, was thinking how we can do it better and find a best solution. Just, just thinking uh, which is a different, a, a difficult task, not done by a, a dynamic scheduler. Like you and me, we're thinking what to execute one first and we, we, we create this schedule and then we make it fixed. 
and we say the computer execute this task, then this, then send the message, then this, and then send the message. This will be the static schedule, and this will be optimal, the best thing you can see. And it's, this is this includes which processors shall be executed when, in which node, and when to trigger each process and each communication. It's very difficult. It's what we say an NP hard problem. So it's not deterministic polynomial time. Uh, we don't have a real solution. We have to find some heuristics. That's why try, simulate, try, and find the best solution. So exactly like uh, you will be doing here, you are thinking many solutions, and then you select one solution. Exactly the same could do the dynamic scheduler. Just try and improve. Try, make a simulation, and improve. So uh, make a allocation of tasks, when, where shall be executed, count how long it will take and remember and then make another solution count how long it will take compare if it is better if it is worse than ignore if it is better than keep this and try again and try again and so on the problem is we can have many many solutions and we cannot test all of them for example let's assume we have 10 tasks and we have five nodes and we have <coughs> to find a distribution which task shall be executed in which node and when. So we have at least 5 to the 10 of combinations. And this is about 10 billion, no, 10 million, 10 million possible combinations. Only your 10 tasks and 5 nodes. And not, that's not too much. And just to try all 10 million combinations to find the best could take very, very long. Therefore, we are not going to try all of them. There are some algorithms to, to try to, to find a good solution. Not the best, but a good solution. For example, I'm going to men just mention them, uh, but I'm not going to be able to explain them. Uh, we can do it later in another uh, le uh, lesson if you want. So we have the kinetic algorithms. We have artificial networks, artificial neuronal networks. We have Newton approximation. We have particle filter, and you can use your human, uh, your common human sense. So, if you are uh, thinking about these solutions, we are not even to try all these solutions. You are going to find one way what uh, what is most promising. Well, but normally we don't have so many options. This is if every task can be executed on any node. But the reality is different. We have some constraints. For example, it depends how much memory the nodes have. Maybe it's not an homogeneous system. Maybe some nodes are bigger than the others, and then some applications can run not on these uh, nodes. Or maybe some nodes will, <coughs> <coughs> will require some input-output devices which are attached only to one process, then you cannot distribute these, these applications in on other nodes. So you are reducing the number of, of freedoms, degrees of freedoms which you have, and this will make the scheduling more simple because you don't have the, too much freedom to, to, to place any application in any, in any node. Okay, uh, the most simple case will the hardware consists of homogeneous uh, uh, the of homogeneous nodes, so uh, every node can execute any task. More difficulties, it has more restrictions, less degree of freedoms. Maybe it's faster to make the plan. Nodes are not homogeneous, so they may have different input output. So here you can see you have these nodes and they have this input output. So the applications which need these devices shall be executed here, and they cannot go somewhere else. Maybe they have different memory and different uh, CPU time, a uh, CPU speed. So task will need in this CPU longer than in the other CPU. And this can make the scheduling much more complex. And maybe you have different interconnections. Not every node is directly connected to any other node. Maybe we have to re-forward messages. And then we have to consider this when two, communica two applications are communicating, maybe they shall be the best in the same node or in one in two nodes which are directly connected it will be a bad idea if these two applications are uh, communicating very intensively to place it on different sides of the network so that the messages has to go through many nodes 
too too many hops so we are blocking too too much too many communications links for these communications of these applications which are very often so if we see they communicate very often they shall be i said before the same in the same node or in nodes which are connected directly mm -hmm. okay and now let's talk about this plan the task allocation first to, to make the things simple, we are going to assume that all processors are identical. So any task can be executed in any process. And we can have three types of multiprocess scheduling. Partitioning scheduling, the global scheduling, and semi-partitioning scheduling. I'm going to handle this at the end of this lesson. But only remember there are three ways how to make this schedule. But this will be at the end of, of the lesson. First, let's consider an example and let's try to do it by ourselves. We have this set of applications, these uh, circles. And this is the time each application will, will need, x, 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 x. And then we have communications ways. To send a message from here to here will take y, y. Uh, of course, all this, uh, I use the same uh, letters, but th the time may be different. Maybe the, the network is not homogeneous, or maybe some messages are longer than others. So these all times may be different, even like all these computations times. And how shall we do? How shall we find a, a, a solution? Try and try until we find a good solution. I said before, not the best solution. We don't need the best solution. We need just a good solution. And this is the loop. Generate a configuration, then simulate at all times, record the time, compare with other older uh, solutions, and keep the best. And we are going to keep in this loop until we, we find something which is good enough. OK. Uh, this will be a very simple solution. We use only one processor. So this is one processor. All tasks will be executed in the same node. And therefore, the communication here is almost zero. This is the best thing we can have for communication. If they are in the same <coughs> computing node, then the communication is just passing a pointer from data from here to here and will be very fast. OK, all are in the same node. No concurrency. This is the problem, the drawback. So if we have only one CPU here, then first will be this executed. And when this is concluded, then maybe this. And with this is executed, then this, and this, and this. And the, the nice thing is, which task will be executed when? It makes no difference. So at the end, we have to wait until all are executed. So the schedule is not so critical. The only thing we have to consider is when every task is ready to be executed. For example, after the execution of this, we can execute this or this, and which makes no difference. If it will be a distributed system and the messages are going to other computer, then it will make a difference. But here, if I execute first this or this, makes no difference. Or maybe first this, and then this, and then this, and then this, makes no difference. OK. Now, let's make a partition. Now I have two processors. These two applications will run on this, and all other applications are running on this. The communication time here is zero. Only the communication going from this processor to this processor will take some time. And the only thing I have to consider is A and B shall be not sent at the same time. Besides this, when I'm going to execute any of these tasks makes no difference because this task has to wait until A and B arrive. So if I execute very fast then, and then then it's the same as if I execute this and at the end this. It has to wait in any time and the time will be the sum of all of this. OK, this will be a very bad solution. I have this will be slower than this because I have no concurrency. Even if I am using two processors, this will be executed only after all these are concluded. So these two processors are not going to be working at the, at the same time. First, this processor has to execute all its tasks. And when it has concluded, then we add this time for the communication, and then we execute this task. So no concurrency, a very bad solution. Worse than this, because now it takes longer to times 
why, why. Do you see, huh? there is no concurrency, no tasks are, are going to be executed at the same time. So we have to take, to think a little bit longer and try to find a better distribution. For example, a better distribution will be this. I am using four processors and maybe now I have parallelity. Now I have concurrency, high concurrency. Many things are going to be executed at the same time. Okay, first I'm going to be execute this. There is no way. And then I'm sending this message and then these two applications can be executed at the same time. And then I'm going to send this message and these two are going to be executed at the same time and maybe these two at the same time. So I can have up to three applications running at the same time. And then I'm going to get this. Maybe then only two are going to be executing at the same time. Then I have to wait until these two are concluded and these are going to be executed. Okay, and I can see the solution is not very good because this processor will be waiting until this and this is concluded. So here, between this and these all three processors, I have no concurrency. This, this processor will wait until all this is concluded and then I can execute it. So actually, I do not need this processor. I could have these two applications in this or this. And now the other question is, will it, it make a difference if I move this application from here to here? If this takes long, um, sorry, if this takes long, maybe it is a good idea to execute this here because then it can begin executing as long as this is still working. So, but this is something we have to try and try, simulate and simulate and try to find the, the best solution. Okay. <clears throat> and now let's assume I have more tasks that use this. Let's consider only this, this, this processor. I have task A, B, A and B, C, D and E. And if we have only a local view, we don't know which will be the best sequence of applications. We don't know this application C is waiting for your message from B. We take have a, only a local view of this processor. So we execute A and then the, norm, the local scheduler will, will take this decision, what shall I activate after A? I can activate C and then D and then E and at the end B. Okay, for this processor, it makes no difference. The same, the time will be the same until all this is concluded. But this is waiting for a data from this, from B. And if I execute first this chain, then B will be much more later and it will, the whole system will take longer. Okay, but this is a problem. We cannot take this decision looking only locally at this node. We have to take a global view and we have to know who is waiting for what and then we can generate a global schedule. And this is the problem. First, I said each node can take its own schedule, can decide which task to execute then. It will get from the global scheduler only a set, a, a set of tasks which it shall execute and when it's its own decision. But this is not the optimal solution. It's better if we have an external global scheduler who knows everything and then it can say to each node, execute now that, execute now that, and execute now that. Step after step. And if we take a look to this, maybe that was not so bad. We have only one node. The communication delays are zero. We have to wait until all of them are concluded, but maybe it's not so bad. We have to try and simulate, and then we can know what is the best solution. And now we have another problem. We have migration of tasks. Here, <clears throat> I said, I took the decision. This will be when everything will be executed. And then it's fixed. But maybe it's not fixed. Maybe I can take in runtime the decision to move one task from one node to other node. But this will be the next lesson. For the moment, let's conclude here.